Welcome back, veteran community. This is Justin from beyondtheuniform.io, where my goal is to give veterans the tools they need to be successful in their civilian career. My guest today is Ian Folau. I was able to throw together some website and I was bringing in enough leads that we were able to fill everybody's houses. And it just really, it really took off for me. And that was like my first venture. And ever since then, I was hooked. You know, I, the idea that I can make more money than my paycheck uh, was exciting for me. The, the, the fact that I can provide something that somebody's going to pay me even a dollar for just motivated me beyond, uh, beyond, beyond what I could imagine. I found this interview really, really motivational and inspiring. I think you will too. Ian started multiple companies while on active duty and attended the Cornell Tech program where they pair MBA students with science and technology students, master's students, to create a forum to bring new ideas to life. That led to his current company, GetLinks, based in New York. Whether or not you're thinking of starting a company, I really find Ian's perspective very enlivening and shows that you can right now take positive action that can really change your life, whether it's bringing a new company to life, whether it's bringing a new idea to your current company, or just giving you thoughts on starting something for fun on the side. So here is my interview with Ian. Well, Ian, I really appreciate your time and for joining me for the show today. Yeah, Justin, good to be here. Uh, for our listeners, I wanted to give them a quick background on you. And if I mess anything up on this, Ian, please correct me. But uh, Ian's the co-founder and CEO of GitLinks. That's a New York-based startup that helps companies manage and monitor their use of open source software. Um, he started out by studying systems engineer at West Point after which he served in the Army, first as an analyst and intelligence collection coordinator with the 173rd Airborne Brigade Combat Team, then as the company manager and chief intelligence analyst for the 82nd Airborne Division, and finally went back to West Point as an assistant professor for German and leadership mentorship. Ian started multiple startups while on active duty. That's one of the many reasons I was excited to talk to him today. And after leaving the Army, he went to Cornell Tech at NYC, during which he co-founded his most recent company, GetLinks. Uh, Ian, did I get that right? That all sounds good, man. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, to kick things off, I, I'm always curious to learn about at what point you knew you were going to leave the Army and how you approached that decision. Yeah, so I was uh, when I decided to get out of the I actually got out of the army at nine years, um, and we all know that twenty years is retirement. So typically the math goes: if you hit ten, you're in for life. Um, so I really felt like I, I needed to make that decision before I hit the ten year mark, uh, whether or not I was leaving. Um, I kind of put things in place when so I had a five year commitment to the army after leaving West Point, um, and I hit that five year mark. Um, or when I hit that five-year mark, I I was reached out to by West Point to uh, come or apply to teach there. So I looked at that and I said, you know, actually that is something that I, I'd, I'd love to do. Uh, I was at 82nd at the time. And uh, so I applied or I threw my name in the hat there and uh, and I got accepted. And, and um, then I had to go talk to my branch manager and say, hey, I'd like to go teach at West Point, which they weren't really happy about. Um, I guess, well, I had my time done um, in, in branch qualifying, so I was able, I was allowed to go. It was just branch didn't want me to go. Um, was Didn't think it would necessarily be good for my career. So really at that point, I said, you know, I, I can either get out of the Army now at five years or you can allow me to go to West Point uh, and teach. So they, in the end, just folded and said, okay, go, go stay in the Army and, and go to West Point and teach. Um, so yeah, I went and did my master's degree, went and taught at West Point and, and when I did a master's degree, I had a one year master's, which meant, which meant I have three years of uh, service afterwards. All three years were then spent at West Point teaching. So really when it came down to it, that was the end of my commitment at, at the nine year mark. Um, and if I were to pull another job following my time at West Point, I would have stayed in for, you know, three more years, two or three more years, been at the 11, 12 mark. And then would have said, you know, it's too late to to really just give it all up and, and, and give up retirement. So 
So it was really that that turning point right there at nine years that I said, you know, I'm free from any contract. Uh, I, I'm able to make a decision right now, and and I had this. I've always had this passion of of starting a business and seeing what I'm made of on out in the civilian world. So I said, you know, I did my time and did my service is what I wanted to do. But I also have other goals such as uh, leading leading companies, and uh, I want to see if I can do that. Yeah, that's awesome. It's it's um, always tough doing that calculus too of, like you said, that that nine-year point, do you stay in and, and just go all in and, and get that benefit of the retirement or do you get a, a jump earlier on that civilian career? And it sounds like, um, yeah, it's interesting hearing how you navigated that. Yeah. And, you know, there's I, looking at other people getting out as well was a big factor. Um, some people that had left a little bit later um, saying that they felt like they were still in the same they really gained no benefit um, past, you know, the five, six, seven year mark um, being in 12 years, um, which was surprising to me. But what they felt like when they were out there getting employment or looking for employment was they were put in the same pool as the guys in the five that got out after five years. And they're like, man, I, I felt like I, I should probably have some kind of advantage here, but I really don't. Um, so it was just a matter of when you get out as opposed to how long you stayed in and those guys minds and that that kind of played a factor in the decision i made as well mm. well with those nine years in how did you think about reserves did you choose to to join the reserves or how did you approach that decision uh i chose not to go to the reserves um i did talk to a lot of people uh about that decision um it was initially more for the health benefits that I was looking for that. So health insurance, I had a family, uh, I had three kids at the time and, uh, trying to figure out, you know, if what's the easiest or the cheapest way to get health insurance, you know, maybe I can do the reserves, get a little bit of supplemental income and not really worry about the big insurance bills. Uh, in the end, uh, enough people convinced me that it wasn't entirely necessary if that's the only reason I'm doing it. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's how I navigated that. I did not do the reserves. And before we go on to talk about the, the startup thing, cause I, I think it's really fascinating to think of how you started to get your feet wet with startups while on active duty. Um, I, I'm just curious. It's always interesting when people make transitions to anything, there's some sort of expectation of what life will be like. And, I'm I'm wondering what was most surprising for you when you did make that transition from active duty to civilian life. If there was anything that was unexpected or that you had any sort of misconception while you were on active duty of what life would be like or or anything just kind of took you by surprise when you did end up making that transition. Yeah, I guess uh, surprising wise, um, it was, I think for a lot of people, it's surprising on how... um, Awkwardly, your job skills play into civilian roles, um, and it's never a one-to-one match. Um, a lot of times, it's a matter of just convincing people of your skills as opposed to your, you know, prior experience and, and job titles. Um, so that's a that's a surprising part to most people, and, and a lot of people feel like, all right, I have all this management skills or. Uh, this leadership skills, at least, um, that's got to play a role somewhere. Um, and being willing to work on your own as a worker, as opposed to managing a team is, is sometimes tough as well. Um, uh, because most, most military guys like to be around people like to, uh, be a part of a team. And, uh, it could be surprising to realize that in order to to get into a company or get into uh, working somewhere, you're going to have to uh, really do some grunt work again and and not really capitalize off of your leadership abilities. Mm. That that aspect of explaining what you do to others, what what role did that play for you? Because I, I kind of picture you blazing your own path as an entrepreneur, and I'm wondering. Did, did that play as big of a role for you or was it in, in regards to like talking to co-founders or to potential investors or, or in what way did it play a role for you? Absolutely. Um, I, I think I'm always constantly trying to sell myself, right? So I'm, I, there is no direct translation to what I did in the army to civilian life in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, as an intelligence officer, I was 
you know, predicting what the enemy is going to do. And I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, how to keep my, my guys safe, um, by really going out there and using all these intelligence uh, sources that I have. Um, that was really cool, but it was really hard to tell people why this is important for them to, to understand. Uh, when I started my company, um, we focus on, on scoring open source projects, you know, open source software, public software. Um, so we score this stuff and, and my co-founders are both technical. So they have a direct relationship to this product. They're building it. Right. Um, when I come in as the CEO and a co-founder of this company and the investor asked me, so tell me about the team and tell me what everybody's contributions to this, this project is. Um, I had at the beginning a very hard time, under, like really quantifying, this is my contribution. Um, I can say, yeah, I'm a leader, you know, and, then, and leader is, is fine. Uh, you know, sometimes people respect that or sometimes people just look at it as a soft skill and nothing that concrete enough to, for them to invest in. Um, but, you know, I had to look at my career and say, all right, what I did was analysis. Um, so, and I pulled in a lot of data. So I'm a data analyst, right? So I, I pull in data, I analyze it and I predictive anal and I do predictive uh, analysis. Uh, and that's exactly what my product does. Um, so, so now I can go to an investor and say, you know, for the army, I was a chief data analyst, as opposed to saying I was an intelligence officer, which nobody really understands. But when I say a chief data analyst, they say, oh, great. You're working on a product that's focused on data um, and analyzing it. You're perfect. You're a perfect fit, right? So it's it's really just manipulating or, or working around what your skill set is, as opposed to what your job title is, um, and then applying that to you know whatever you're trying to do. That's great. I mean, that, that comes up repeatedly on the show of people talking about the need to explain one's background in terms that, that they'll understand. And I really appreciate the way that you spelled that out. I think that was a great concrete example of, um, you know, it's not, nothing you said is misrepresenting your background, but you're doing the heavy lifting of explaining your background in a way that's relevant to the job at hand and a way that the listener will understand. And I think that that, t I, I imagine that took a lot of work to get to that point where you had that succinct enough and it landed well enough. But I'm, I'm just curious if you have any advice, because I think this is so important. If you have any advice for veterans on how they might refine that message, how they might tweak the explaining of their job in a way that will land for their target job. Um, yeah, one, one thing to keep in mind is, um, nobody's, nobody's obviously going to give you a job just because, um, they feel sorry for you. Uh, they have money on the line. Um, they need you to come in and make a huge impact. Um, so coming up with a night of a, a way of telling your, your story in a way that you feel you're going to make an impact on their bottom line. Um, you're going to bring you know, you're either going to save the money or you're going to bring them new money. Um, that's what you need to focus on. Um, and it's not about titles anymore. It's about, I am capable of doing this. I've done it in the past. Um, and that's how I'm going to save you money or make you money. Um, and, and that's, that's the key. Um, yeah. So I would, I wouldn't always depend on leadership as being your number one attribute um, because not every job out there requires leadership. And sometimes, believe it or not, people don't want leadership to be your leading attribute. Uh, they want, you know, I don't know, data science to be your leading attribute or your, your coding ability to be your leading attribute um, or sales and, and marketing be your leading attribute leadership uh is a is an add-on in some of these occupations or in some of these job titles um so just be aware of that um and you know but for the ones that are actually have leader in this name or manager in this name yeah talk up leadership all you can um but just be aware of the job title and where you're really going to make impact don't force your impact or force something into your into what you're giving a company um uh you know, don't force 
leadership, if leadership's not what they're asking for, force uh, talk about something that is actually going to bring value to that company and make that uh, your spotlight. Mm, that's great. I think that's really, really sound advice. Um, and I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your experience starting companies while on active duty. Um, Taylor Justice, who's also been on the show, introduced us, and that's one of the things that really jumped out at me. And you know, I have to admit, I, I'm envious that I never got into entrepreneurship until well after you know um, a year or two into business school. And um, I was curious to learn about your experience of founding companies on active duty, what, what the companies were like, how you went about it, and uh, yeah, just what that was like. Yeah, yeah. So Taylor's a good guy. Uh, I like him. He's got a great company. Um, when I went through uh, West Point, I did not focus on money at all. I focused on uh, just getting my degree, playing sports, uh, and graduating. And when I graduated, I realized that I'm suddenly making money. Um, I now have a, a salary, and and uh, you know I could either I could figure out what to do with that salary. Um, and whether or not I'm going to put it in the bank, whether or not I'm going to spend it. Um, I thought about investing. And, you know, when I thought about investing, I thought about, um, you know, stocks, mutual funds, all that kind of stuff. Um, I picked up a book called uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, and, uh, you know, I would always recommend this book as kind of a starter book in, in understanding what entrepreneurship is and what um, having money make money means. Uh, but after reading that book, I, I decided, man, I can actually use this money to make more money. Um, uh, and so I can, when I come home at night, I can either sit in front of a TV or I can figure out how to come up with some idea that's going to solve some kind of problem or help somebody out that they're going to pay me money for. Um, so the moment I, I, I read the book, I actually, in, in a couple weeks later, I owned my first house. Um, so I, I bought this house. Uh, I found this uh, this market in um, in my next duty station um, at Fort Huachuca, uh, where a bunch of us students were going there to get our initial training, our our initial officer training, and there wasn't enough housing for us. So everybody, about ninety percent of us, were being forced to live off post at hotels, various hotels around the uh, area. Um, so what my idea was, was essentially what Airbnb is today, but for military people. And what I called it was Wachuca TDY. And so I bought my first house and there was a three bedroom house. And, uh, and I went and I found this, this property manager. I didn't want to manage this myself necessarily. And I said, Hey, this is my idea. I'm going to rent out every one of these rooms to uh, service members that are on TDY here. Um, and we're going to make this house just amazing, right? We're going to, we're going to bring in cable TV, PlayStations, we're have all sports, the, the closet's full of sports balls and, and whatever you want. Um, we're going to, you know, they're going to have their own living room, their own kitchen, bathrooms, um, and they're going to be able to live outside of a hotel for the, the five, six months that they're here. Um, for on the, on the service member side, they were going to pay the same rate no matter what, whether it's going to be at a hotel or at somebody's house, uh, as long as it's a legitimate business, they're, they're, they're able to pay it. Right. So I, I started this business up and, uh, just started renting out my house and, um, we would get, you know, three people in, in the house and they would each pay their TDY rate for, for a room in the house. Um, and it turned out to be like a hit, you know, there was, uh, I constantly were getting people more and more people through word of mouth, uh, coming into the house. Uh, suddenly everybody in the area started hearing about what I was doing with rentals. And they're like, Hey, I want to rent my house out like that too. So I started this company, uh, what you could see why with, uh, you know, got up to nine houses that were managing, uh, the inventory for, I, I made up this website. I, I remember I took one class, uh, in college on how to, how to make a website. So I, I was able to throw together some website and I was bringing in enough leads that we were able to fill everybody's houses. And it just really, it really took off for me. And that was like my first venture. And ever since then I was hooked, you know, I, the idea that I can make more money than, uh, than my, than my paycheck, uh, was 
exciting for me. The, the, the fact that I can provide something that somebody's going to pay me even a dollar for, uh, just motivated me beyond, uh, beyond, beyond what I could imagine. Um, so from there, I just started growing more businesses. I, I would start thinking about problems and solutions and figuring out how I can improve things for other people. Um, so I've gone everywhere from that real estate side. I've done a bunch of online uh, uh, websites. Uh, I've done uh, designated, dri- designated driver uh, uh, company. I've done a uh, retail company. Uh, so e-commerce selling rugby balls. I would design and manufacture my own rugby balls. And yeah, so just I just dabble here and there. But really, in the end, it's just I love the fact that when that first dollar is spent on a product or a service that I'm providing, it just gets me really amped up and, and really excited. <laughs> Ian, I am so bummed right now that I'm not sitting across from you with a beer. There's like so much I want to delve into right here. You just got me so energized with uh, everything you just said. <laughs> and, and you know, one thing that immediately jumps out is with entrepreneurship, they talk about a bias for action. And what I love in your story right there is you literally went from buying a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and weeks later, you, you pulled the trigger. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, in this process, you made lots of mistakes and you learned a ton. But I just love that bias for for action, for, for throwing things out. And I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, everyone listening to this show is probably having the same reaction I just did, which is a, an extreme amount of energy just hearing this story. And I'd love to, to di- drill, um, drill into a little bit more detail around um, maybe just starting with any resources as you were starting this, like what, what would you recommend to people that helped you start to learn about how to grow your business or how to start it or anything that gave you um, some, some knowledge that was very powerful in this process? Yeah, you know, I, I think one of the benefits of um, starting business today as opposed to 10 years ago when I was starting business, my first business is, was there's so much out of the box stuff that you can just take and, and run with now, uh, prepackaged. So like if you wanted to start a, a website up, you could do that in, in 10 minutes on, on a couple different types of, uh, websites, so Weebly, Wix, um, uh, Squarespace. So it's so easy to start up a website these days. Um, so just, you know, today there's so much prepackaged stuff. So if you're, if you're looking at building a social, uh, website, right? So something, a competitor of Facebook, there's a company out there that does that. Um, if you want to build a blog, there's a company out there that does that. Um, so I would just in, in, invest a little bit of upfront capital and, and, and those type of prepackaged things just to kind of test the idea out, uh, see if it would flow, see if people would, uh, respond to it, you know, maybe even make a waiting list and, um, and get people, you know, put a little blurb on, you know, what you think you're going to do and, and what service you're going to provide and, and blast it out to people and see if they would sign up for a waiting list. Um, just anything you do to really validate that this is something that needs to be solved and, uh, and uh, do it. You know, I, I always think of the idea of, you know, somebody wrote a book and I can't remember what it is, but uh, instead of uh, ready, aim, shoot, it's ready, shoot, aim. Uh, so essentially shooting and then aiming along the way. Um, and that's kind of where I, I, I feel my philosophy is, is let's just make it happen. You know, I only need 40% of the information. I don't need a 90% before I'm going to pull the trigger. I'm going to pull the trigger and then I'm going to make, make the mistakes, like you said, and, and just adjust on the fly. Um, and really, you're, you're understanding your user along the way. Um, you really won't understand them until they actually have something or they're looking at something and can give you real feedback. I love that. I mean, it, in, in particular about um, shooting before aiming, one of the great things with any internet or technology-based business is the extremely rapid way in which you can refine your product. And so unlike a, a ma- even a manufactured item where there's, uh, you know, maybe months to produce a physical product with technology, you can tweak it in minutes. And that's one of the most common mistakes I see entrepreneurs making is over-refining the first version of 
um, of, of a product before releasing it. And so often the first version of your product you get out, you realize that the product itself is not the insight you're looking for. You realize that people are using one particular feature or asking for something else that wasn't even central to the idea, but may be the bigger business. And so what I like about what you said is you're getting something out there really quickly. You're not overly manufacturing it so that you can learn and iterate and ultimately hone in on what the, the better, the bigger business opportunity is. Yeah, and and you mentioned resources. I, I didn't really touch on that. I mean, there's so many books written. There's so many. I mean, I I don't, and I'm most of your listeners are probably like this, just like me. You know, listening to podcasts, listening to audiobooks um, at all times. Uh, I mean, I like music just as much as the next guy. But uh, am I going to walk away a smarter person? Uh, probably not. So. I'm going to, on my way to work, I'm going to listen to an audiobook. On my way back from work, I'm going to listen to a podcast. Um, and I'm going to spend most of my time doing that um, because that's where you get your true education. That's where you really learn and refine and, and figure out new inspiration of, of a way or approach to a problem that you might be having. What, what, uh, what comes to mind in terms of podcasts or audiobooks that you would recommend? Oh, um, one I'm reading right now is called Traction, um, and it really focuses on a lot of uh, different avenues in which to uh, market yourself. Um, I think I can't remember how many, over 14 different avenues is what the author starts talking about, and different ways of getting yourself out there to validate uh, both your problem as well as, uh, you know, outreach and and figuring out or getting more users and acquiring more users. So that was really good for me in my stage right now where I am in my company, where I'm trying to acquire more more users. I'm trying to get more traction to be able to display to to uh, to investors. Um, so, yeah, I, I would recommend that one. Um, let's see. On the podcast side, um, there's a few that I've... I've listened to um, Entrepreneur on Fire. Uh, I used to listen for fairly regularly. I, I don't as much anymore. Um, Smart Passive Income is a really cool one. I, I really enjoy that one still. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, EO Fire, I'm trying to get um, uh, John on the show. He's an Army guy who started that podcast, and it's pretty good. I'm, I'm impressed. He does five or uh, five or seven a week, and he's on to like 1,400 podcasts. He's very transparent about the revenue model and, um, you know, similar format of just interviewing people, but he gets a lot of cool entrepreneurs on there. I'll, I'll have to check out Smart Passive Income. And I, I would just add on to that list. I know the book itself is dated, but I think the principles are, are still worthwhile with um, Tim Ferriss's 4-Hour Work Week. It's very old, but I think this thought, a, a lot of what Ian's referring to in terms terms of you know getting uh, email signups and just throwing things out there I think Tim has a lot of principles in there that are still valid and then you know it's probably the number one podcast out there Tim Ferriss's podcast you know he continues to, to just throw out some really good information not all of it specific to entrepreneurship but that's um, that's one I would add to the list as well yeah um, absolutely uh, yeah and, and I was wondering um, so, so my experience with entrepreneurship has been you learn so much, but it's through so many mistakes. And you just accumulate these scars from just royally screwing something up. And then you learn, well, I'm not going to do that again. And that, that seems, at least from my vantage point, to be the academic process of learning to start companies is just learning by making mistakes and trying and failing and getting back on the horse. And I, I'm wondering, as you look back on the, the different companies you started while in the military, what were some of the mistakes that you made and what were some of the lessons that you took away from those? Yeah, I mean, just real quick in, in reference to failing and, uh, you know, there's a saying or there's something that I also believe in is it's failing fast. Um and, you know, failing is, is inevitable. There's, you know, building a startup or building some kind of business is you're always going to come up with something, some hypothesis and realize it's wrong. And um, but the point is to get to that that decision really quick. Uh, you don't want to just continue down some kind of line forever and, and then realize, you know, six months later that, man, I should have made, made a pivot maybe four months ago before, you know, I'm, I've spent all this money now. Right. So 
when you fail, fail fast um, and really try to push yourself to get to the end of a line uh, so that you can turn around and move somewhere else. Um, so some of the failures I've had in the past, um, uh, I would say one one lesson I've learned um, from one of my businesses is, is it's hard to work with people um, sometimes and it's hard to find the right team. Um, I've, I've learned that and I've been now able to figure out what type of people I'd like to work with, what type of, uh, uh, teams I like to form, um, in, in, pre- in some previous companies with some teams that I've worked with some teams that weren't as excited about the idea, right? So if, if somebody's going to work with you, especially as a co-founder, they have to have an unending passion for what's going on. Um, and somebody that's, that has one foot in, one foot out is not somebody you need on your team. Not only are they going to drag you down, um, you're going to, uh, or drag your business down, you're going to have a lot of resentment and there's going to be a lot of bitterness about how much work I do versus how much work they do. And, uh, and, and it'll pile up at some point where you're just like, man, I can't do this anymore. And you're going to split and you're going to go your own ways. So that's something I've learned, um, in previous, uh, you know, ventures that now when I started this comp- my latest company, this one, Git Links, um, I focused solely on team first. It was well before we even thought about the idea. Um, uh, I went out looking for the right team members and I, and I worked together with a bunch of developers. I, I took a bunch out for, for coffee and, and just trying to understand who they are as social on the social side as well as uh, how good they are on, on the uh, credential side. Um, and, and I formed, I, I think, a really great team, uh, one that is not a bunch of clones of myself. And that's, what I, that's a tip I would give when I, say, when I tell people about how to form a team is don't hire a bunch of yous. Hire people that are complementary to you, meaning that they don't have your skill set, you don't have theirs, um, which means you can't step on each other's toes because you obviously are not as skilled as the other person, which makes for a really good harmonious uh, uh, a team and, and, and helps you progress together um, because everybody is doing their own part and nobody's fighting over who has the right to stay. This is the way it needs to be done for this specific area. Mm. Man, it's uh, I, I'm feeling my own wounds throbbing as you talk about that because I just think of all the many, many mistakes I've made around hiring and, and team formation. And when you say that, it makes me realize that one of the thing, one of the advantages I think of coming from the military is because you can't pick your team, you become very adept at learning to to, to be able to make it work with anyone. You can work with someone you don't necessarily like, someone who doesn't have the strengths you're looking for, and so you become very adaptive in the team you're working with. And I think the flip side of that, that that I learned through my own mistakes is that you could approach your civilian team as trying to make it work with anyone or believing you can work with anyone. And what I really liked about what you said is that amount of self-knowledge of realizing where, um, you know, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, not trying to find the exact same person as you, but someone who can complement you. And I'm wondering if you had any advice on um, how in those coffee meetings or how in those interactions, how are you able to tease out the people that you might work better with versus people that might not be as good of a fit? Yeah. So finding co-founders is, is a tough challenge. And, and I, I feel like I'm lucky for where I was able to find my co-founders. I was actually going to school, um, at Cornell tech, which is a school that brings together a bunch of business guys and a bunch of that are pursuing MBAs and then a bunch of computer guys that are pursuing masters of uh, engineering or computer science. And uh, so I'm there with, you know, 60, uh, 70 uh, computer science um, students. And, and I had the ability to work side by side with them and, and the curriculum there at Cornell tech is very um, integrative and uh, in, in giving you challenges that you have to form teams around. Um, but for me on, on, Outside of the schoolwork, I also did a bunch of hackathons. That, and this is one of the things that coming out as a veteran was like super foreign to me. Like, what is a hackathon? Uh, a hackathon is, is a weekend typically where you spend um, 
a bunch of time with, with a small team coming up with an idea and, and building it out. Um, typically what comes out at the end is some kind of prototype of your idea, whether it's a website or an app or some kind of robot or whatever. But um, this was, for me, a really cool opportunity to understand how engineers work. Um, I didn't, I wasn't particularly technical, but um, one thing I could do is, is everything else, right? I can go get water. I can go get, <laughs> I can put together a PowerPoint deck. I can come up with strategies and call people on the phone and ask them for uh, feedback. And I, I can do everything else. Um, but the technical side, somebody that's more technical than me has to do that. And I have to be able to convey in a way to them that they understand where, where I'm talk what I'm talking about. I have to be patient with them and understanding that they have an opinion too, and I can't just boss them around. Um, but I think what was really key for me at these hackathons was understanding the language of the developer and understanding their, their rate or, or their pace of, of, of work and, and how they like to be talked to, how they uh, despise what other people, how other people talk to them. Um, but really getting to when you spend, you know, night after night with, with somebody, you really get to know how they react to you. Um, and you never, and I, and I, I consciously do this. I never try to downplay anybody's contribution to a team. Um, on the contrary, I, I try to uplift everybody and try to say, you know, this is awesome. You know, this is great. Uh, you know, let's, this is what I've been getting from, from some feedback from the people I've been talking to. Let's see if we can integrate this somehow to make this even better. Um, but really, I, I've, I've gotten a tip from somebody in the past. Uh, he's the CEO of a large marketing firm here in New York City. And he uh, asked him, how do you work with creatives? How do you work with engineers and creatives? This is, these aren't the people that I've dealt with in the Army. Um, the people I dealt with in the Army were just hard charging, let's go, like, break it down type people. Um, and these guys are just very, you know, they have skills and they have temperament and uh, <laughs> and all this other stuff that I'm not used to dealing with. And he said, you know, I, I do it the same way I did it in ranger school, which is I, I did everything. I carried the ammo. I carried I carried the, the 240 Bravo. I carried everything heavy that nobody else wanted to carry. I did it. And and that proved to them that I was worth sticking around. Um, and I've done that at my marketing firm when I first got out of the army and, and joined that marketing firm. This is the other CEO speaking. He's like, I just showed all these creatives, like, I will do anything uh, to make sure that you can work even more efficiently. You can work uh, with less uh, barriers. Uh, I will break it all down for you. Um, and they loved me for it. And, and that's how I made it so far in, in this company going from a veteran to a to a CEO in a marketing firm full of creatives and not the type of people you typically see in the military. Um so I take that and I and I go out and I and I talk to and that's just the way I approach um working with people that that I don't necessarily I'm not the same type of person, right? I'm, I'm uh, this guy that is not a developer, but I'm working with developers and I want them to know that I'm there. I'm going to stay up till five in the morning. Even if I have nothing else to do, I'm going to stay up because you're staying up. Yeah. What great so advice. So that's my man. approach with, with, with those guys. Yeah, yeah. What great advice. I mean, what a great way, not, not only to learn the lay of the land and learn all the different functional roles and areas of a company, but also to show that you have some skin in the game, even when, especially for a tech company, non-technical people like myself and, and you, we can't add as much immediate value on a day-to-day -day basis. So being able to cover all the other bases, being able to pull your own weight and find ways, even if it is, and I know you kind of threw it out a little bit facetiously, but even if it is as simple as like grabbing water for people, like showing them that you're willing to do whatever it takes to support the team. And I think it's such an, uh, a fantastic example of leadership. Uh, one thing I was going to ask about next was you mentioned Cornell Tech, and from what I understand, it's a pretty unique program. And I loved this this aspect where it seems like they bring not only MBA students, but then people from that STEM or science, technology, engineering, math, master students background together. And so they create this environment to bring new ideas to market. And I'm wondering what that program was was like for you. Oh, it was an awesome program. Um, I think, you know, I want more veterans to be there. Um, and I was the first uh, veteran 
uh, MBA to really to go through the program. And, uh, and I'd love to see a lot more go through. I think one of the barriers for some veterans or, or they self select themselves out of a tech program like that so as Cornell Tech and, then, and I'm coming out of the infantry or, or aviation or whatever it is and I don't think I'm techy enough to be in this program and I think that's wrong I, I you know the the program was meant to say essentially when you say tech it means you're living today right you, you can't touch any pro any company without having some kind of tech in it uh, so uh, for me I found the program um, to be my perfect fit. I wanted to be entrepreneurial. I wanted to do a startup um, and I wanted to get an MBA, um, but I didn't want to spend a lot of time uh, getting an MBA and it's a one-year program. So, I mean, everything just fit for me with this program. So it was exactly what I wanted. Um, I, again, tell you, I told you that I felt like I was in a, just a perfect place to find co-founders uh, and it absolutely was. Uh, the fact that you have uh, all these uh, computer scientists that you build relationships over a year, um, they get to know you, you get to know them, and then you can really form some really solid teams. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a good program. What um, for for someone who is listening to this and they're excited about this, what advice would you have to, for them in the application process? And I'm wondering because I always think with business school of casting a little bit of a wide net and applying a couple different spots, I'm wondering like what other programs are out there like this, if, if there are ones that are similar to this. Yeah. Yeah. Some advice I would give is, is proving that one, I mean, you have coming out of the military, you're going to have this leadership uh, trait already kind of pinned to you. So they already assume all right, you were out there um, doing some really crazy stuff in the military. Um, you know, you work in teams uh, to accomplish missions. Like you understand that that's that's a good quality. Uh, you're going to have to prove uh, other qualities too, though. You know, your ability to adapt to situations, your ability to to innovate and think of new uh, solutions, um, and uh, you know, so that's that's the stuff that you have to start convincing them of. If you have a tech background, you know, that's a plus. Obviously, if you can do anything on the coding side, if you can talk tech or talk coding with other developers, that's awesome. Um, and and then on the entrepreneurial side, I, I really don't think I came in because I was this awesome tech guy. I was more of an entrepreneurial guy. So if you're, if you're wondering about entrepreneurship, like I, like we said earlier, just do it make something and see if somebody will give you a dollar for it. Um, and that'll, and that'll show, you know, whether or not you're made to do this type of stuff, and then go in and, and promote that when you go into uh, apply to come or schools like this, if there's any other school like it, um, I, I believe I've heard, I've heard of something out in the university of Washington where they're trying to bring together um, business guys and computer science guys under the same roof. So maybe there's a program out there. Um, I have another friend that's going to a program out in uh, UT Austin, and the program is focused on uh, bringing university technology to market. So I think it's a one-year program, and, and you go in there just to really realize how you how you get a technology, build a product around it, and then and then take it to market. So those are some those are the three. So those other two are the only ones that I know that are similar in, in some way to the Cornell Tech. Awesome. And and let's talk a little bit about Get Links. I, I know I gave the one, you know, half a sentence explanation, but for someone on active duty, how would you explain what Get Links does? Yeah, so Get Links is a software company. So we're building software. Um, and our software essentially scores open source software. And, when I talk about open source software, just really plainly, that, that means public software. That's a bunch of stuff that helps developers code and, and, and build websites, apps, and robots. It's all, it's all public and available for the taking. So it's like going to the library and checking out a book. You know, It's a public book, so I'm allowed to take it and I'm allowed to use it and, and gain knowledge from it. Or, uh, but in this case, it's, it's public code you can take it and you can build on top of it and make some really amazing website or, or some cool product out of it. Um, 
and, and it's amazing. It's a phenomenon. The open source, there's, there's millions of open source components out there or software out there that people can freely use. Um, so our company takes all that and says, now that there's millions of open source software out there, there's also millions of junk out there. Um, so how do you determine what's the best, best product to use for your company? Um, say I'm, say I'm, you know, Google and I, and I want to build something really cool, something new, but I don't want to build it from scratch. I'm going to take all this, op- I'm going to take this open source and I'm going to try to find the best one. And I'm going to use that to build my product. We are scoring that open source. So if there are 10 different alternatives, we're going to tell you this one is scoring the best. This one. And when we say score, we say it's got the best community. It's got the best people that are contributing to it. They're actively contributing to it. They're, they're making sure that it's free from bugs and issues and vulnerabilities. Um, that's what we're talking about when we, when we say we're scoring stuff. So in, in a nutshell, that's what we do. We, we score open source software similar to every other score that you see in our, in our world around us. We use scores to, to make every decision almost these days. You know, what movie to watch? Uh, you look at the scores. Uh, what restaurant to eat at? Uh, you look at Yelp or whether or not I'm going to give you a loan. I'm going to look at your credit score. Uh, so, so that's what we're doing. We found this space essentially that has uh, no standard and we're making a standard. That's great. And, and for someone on active duty to paint the picture of what the day-to-day life is like, how, how would you ex, uh, describe, especially when you were first starting, what did your life look like day-to-day and, and uh, week-to-week? Yeah, when we first started, um, it was, I mean, there was a lot of administrative stuff. It was, we were hard charging. We wanted to get working on product. Um, but we had to figure out, you know, are we going to be a C corp? Um, you know, are we going to incorporate, who are we going to incorporate with? Who's our lawyer? Um, you know, do we need an accountant? No, we can, we just need software. Right? What software do we use? Um, and you know, all that kind of administrative stuff was kind of crazy. Um, you know, figuring out who has what shares, uh, of the company, um, how much we're going to, you know, divvy out for our employees. Um, you know, and then and then taxes and and all that crazy stuff. And, you know, it's it's a matter of it took us a few weeks to get past that point uh, right at the beginning. Even though we really just wanted to work on product, we wanted to work on selling. Um, and so that after we got past that, um, we really started to figure out uh, wanted to figure out you know where do we sell our product into the market? Um, yeah. We- we're scoring open source, but what's a product that could actually be used? Um, so we started talking to companies and we started talking to startups as well as large enterprises. And, you know, we would go to the large enterprises and they would say, yeah, we have no idea what open source we're using. Can you tell us what we're using and uh, can you give it a score? And can you manage that for us? Can you monitor it for us and tell us whenever there's something, some kind of issue we need to address? Um so we really took this approach of trying to get out as much as possible to to tell people this is at the core of what we do, but what can we do for you? Um, and that's that's kind of our approach. So on a day to day basis, what I do is I focus a lot on um, getting appointments with uh, with either clients to sell to or investors to get to invest for us. Um, and then in between that, I'm building a network, uh, meeting with mentors, meeting with people that I feel would be beneficial or advantageous for us to know uh, because they're somewhat involved in our space. Um, yeah, so for me, on the business side of the company, it's a lot about building a network, building contacts, and going out and meeting with them, either jumping on a call, jumping on Skype, or going out for coffee with them. And you've mentioned a couple times throughout the interview just different aspects of leadership. And I'm wondering in what ways does leadership in the world of entrepreneurship view from your uh, differ from your view of leadership within the military? Um, yeah, it's, it's different um, because you are kind of on the, so I started my company with two other co-founders 
and we all have essentially an equal stake in the company. We're all here to to progress uh, the company uh, to make it profitable at some point. Um, but so we all have this common goal. Um, it's not necessarily what you see in the military, which is one leader, uh, you know, another person side by side with them on on the enlisted side, and then and then a bunch of um, you know soldiers underneath. Um, it's not structured in that way right at the beginning of a startup. At the beginning of a startup, everybody has an equal stake, so everybody has an equal word in, in the in the strategy or the way ahead. Um, so when it comes down to leadership in that in that sense, when you have you know a small startup, it's it's really about convincing people um, that this is the right strategy, um, and it's not. It's about being patient, about being um, uh, able to take feedback and, and criticism, and to be able to really digest that in a way that's productive to the to the company and and, and making decisions. Um, like nobody, you don't want to stonewall people. Or you don't want to make yourself um, so hard to work with that nobody wants to talk to you anymore. Um, and they just want to do their own thing. So it's really this, this emotional intelligence part of that you kind of learn in the military, but don't really name it that. Um, that's where you really have to put it into play when you're working on the same level playing field with everybody else because they all have the same stake and they all have the same response essentially the same authority and responsibility, you have to really figure out how you are going to play with, uh, nicely with everybody emotionally so that you can progress as a company. That's great. And for those listening who, are, who maybe are on active duty right now and are really fired up about what you said, I, I like that you said, you know, just jump in and try it. I'm wondering if there's any um, advice you would give to them as they – delve into entrepreneurship for the first time while, while on active duty? Yeah, while on active duty. Um, I would say just to jump into it, obviously that's something we already said, um, just do something. Um, I, would, I would start with the website. That's typically how most people start. Um, just to say, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about just taking that first step. Um, and once that happens, you start to get feedback and, uh, and then adjust from there. I think in every one of my, um, uh, ventures, I kind of, I, I just wanted to see what people would react to, how they would react to it. And when people started coming in, it was like, man, I should really start improving on what I'm doing here. Um, so just taking that first step, I, you know, I can't uh, say it enough or uh, emphasize it enough. Uh, just do it, and then you'll see what, what happens from there. Another thing is to network. Um, I think that's one thing that we lack the most in the military is our ability to network and to really see the value of networking. Um, and by networking, I mean uh, find people that are either doing what you're doing um, or have done what you're, you, you're doing or are kind of in an adjacent space Um Find those people, network with them, figure out how they're doing it and how they're doing, how you can make your process better. Um, but really reach out to people and, uh, and capitalize off of that ability to, to talk with somebody that might be an expert in your area. Mm, this is great. I, I've got about a thousand questions left and I realize I don't have time for that. So, so maybe for the final question, I would love to just turn it over to you. And if, if you've got a group of maybe active duty or um, other veterans listening to this, what other advice would you give to them, whether it's about um, their career in general or entrepreneurship or anything you feel passionately about that they, you'd like them to know? Yeah. Um, one thing would be, uh, reach out to other people. There are a lot of people out there that want to help you and, and really don't be shy about it. Um, but when you do reach out to people, so reach out to people that you want to be like, or are doing things that you find exciting. Um, reach out to people that you don't know what they're doing and figure out what they're doing. Uh, one of the hardest parts of coming out of the military is understanding what's out there. And a lot of times military guys, uh, especially 
uh, officers I know that are, that go and just do an MBA, they, they kind of get pigeonholed into either doing finance or consulting because that's all people tell them they're, they're capable of doing. But there's so much more out there. Uh, there's tech and, and understanding what tech is. Like, you won't really understand what tech is until you f- find somebody that works in tech and talking to them. Uh, so really reach out to a, a lot of other people, figure out what they're doing, figure out if it excites you, uh, and because you you want to have as many options as possible. Uh, the other thing I would say is after after you reach out to a bunch of people is, is obviously give back to other people. Um, once you have figured out a path that's successful for you and, and, and has brought you a lot of joy, uh, reach back to people that are behind you and tell them, all right, this is something that I feel is great. Um, uh, I can walk you through it if you want, if you want the help. Um, so I, I think there's this, this accounting system, uh, in the universe of, you know, if I can give something away, somehow I will receive something back in the, in the long run. Um, and I believe that, uh, for sure. Mm. Ian, this is great. Well, I, I appreciate your reaching back, um, with me, with granting the interview and just with the listeners. I, I know that for myself, I'm very, very energized from what you're saying. And it's, um, I think you're providing a lot of very tactical, very relatable stories and advice that, that I've benefited from. And I know the listeners for the show will. So thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Hey, no problem, Justin. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, of course. Thanks and have a good rest of the week. All right, you too. Bye now. Bye. Surface, surface, surface. All right, gang, that's all for today. A couple quick admin items at beyondtheuniform.io. You will find more resources like data, charts, graphs, and a ton of interviews in the podcast section. Um, If you have feedback, if you have ideas on how to make the show better and how to provide more resources to veterans, please drop me a line at beyondtheuniform.io slash ping. Uh, Lastly, not endorsed by um, service to school at all, but it's an organization I've really come to respect based on these interviews. If you are on active duty or if you're a veteran in general and thinking about going to school, that's grad school, undergrad, med school, law school, any type of academic institution, I definitely recommend you check out Beyond the or uh, Service to School. They provide free resources to veterans. They pair you with someone with a similar background who can guide you through the process of everything you need to know uh, to get into the school that's best for you. That's interview prep, resume help, all sorts of things. So check them out at service to school.org. Have a great rest of the week and looking forward to talking to you soon.